The rainy season's been good this year in Bugacera, one of Rwanda's most arid areas. We're with Paul Kagame, who likes to crisscross his country behind the wheel of his armored Range Rover. The Rwandan president, a figure who's dominated his nation since 1994's genocide, doesn't like the back seat of chauffeured limousines. In fact, sometimes on the road I find uh, a problem of uh, the citizens, somebody either being uh, badly treated. Sometimes I see it and stop and say, what is going on? We're headed for Gashora, a village 60 kilometers south of the capital Kigali. Along with his wife Jeanette, Paul Kagami is going to visit the Gashora Girls Academy, a secondary school for girls run by Americans. Yeah. So nice to have you here. Thank you so much. The elite boarding school is centered on science and computing, two areas the president holds dear. He dreams of Rwanda as an African Singapore. That means a focus on economic and social development rather than Western-style democracy. But it's the healthier, better housed and especially better educated citizens who can transform this rural landlocked country into a regional commercial hub. Kagami, a frequent Twitter user himself, is at ease with the students. Mm -hmm. So you can ask a question online. As you saw, there is a, a Khan Academy, it's a new website where there is a video gallery, library, sorry, mm -hmm. where you learn online. So Microsoft has been helping uh, in some aspects. Of yes, the... particularly with, with this. As... Thank you. Thank you, girls. Thank you. Mm -hmm. During these public appearances, Paul Kagami is dead serious and keeps his emotions to himself. But during a Q&A session with the schoolgirls, another persona slowly emerges. Smiling, even joking about the miserable years spent as a youth in a refugee camp in neighboring Uganda. He passionately urges the teenage girls not to look up to Western role models. It's yes you can, Rwandan style. Towards, towards achieving this vision. Don't waste any opportunity. If you have an opportunity, an opportunity for an education, seize it, hold it firmly and run with it. Don't waste any time. Indeed, Kagami's an unabashed feminist. He's proud of pointing out that in Rwanda, a majority of lawmakers, as well as a number of key ministers, are women. Say do we need to give women their rights, and we need to make them part of the nation that should develop and also develop their own country. More than anything, Kagami wants to talk about Rwanda's future. But it's hard to leave the past behind when reminders of the killing are almost everywhere. Niamata saw some 11,000 Tutsis killed by Hutu militias armed with grenades and machetes. It happened here, in a church compound now turned into a memorial. Kagami saw a number of mass graves while commanding the Rwandan Patriotic Front. He eventually asked his fighters to stop showing him such grim sights. He knew refusing their calls for revenge was the only way to foster reconciliation. Because sometimes they would discover some place, like behind the hill in the banana plantation like this, and find so many dead bodies, others still groaning from pain and so on. And they would, you know, let me know and take me there. So I, I started avoiding it. Uh, as we continued with the war, so that it doesn't affect uh, my emotions and, in the end, my judgment. Ethnic tensions still exist, though, and his opponents blame Kagame for being first and foremost a Tutsi leader. However, he seems convinced that Rwanda is looking to a future beyond ethnic identity. The beating heart of this new Rwanda is the presidency, where the 55-year-old Kagame rules with an iron sense of discipline. 
Even close associates aren't safe, facing firing on occasion for the sake of efficiency. Today, he's signing laws to make foreign investment easier. We've been involved in making, uh, doing business as easy as possible here in Rwanda. We've found it to be one of the most important things in our development. It marks a major shift from a few years back. Afari Kagame broke off diplomatic relations with France for four years and fought with Germany after a French probe accused him of playing a key role in unleashing the genocide. Those days are over, according to the departing German ambassador. Mr. President, when we met the first time, uh, you told me about a small dent in our bilateral relationship. And I think uh, due to the efforts of both sides, it's like a dent if you go to the garage, you have got the car. And when you get the car back, it looks even newer than before. Yes, <laughs> that's true. We're <laughs> be very happy with the, the progress that has mm -hmm. been made after a few problems here and there. As proof of returning trust and that Rwanda's fight against corruption isn't just a slogan, the diplomat announces that Germany will be providing Rwanda with direct financial support. My country has pledged for the next three years 60 million euro, including budgetary support. We are one of the bilateral donors who are giving budgetary support to Rwanda. Foreign aid still makes up 40% of Rwanda's budget. A nationalist like Kagame wants to bring that down to zero, something that would mean true independence. In fact, the word has a particular meaning for him. On July the 1st, Rwanda celebrated its 50 years of independence. But Kagame told the crowd that Rwanda didn't gain its freedom with the departure of Belgian colonists in 1962. In Rwanda, for instance, it is only in the last 18 years that we have regained the dignity and identity we lost twice. First, under colonialism, and then, ironically, at the time of independence. Paul Kagame may have traded in his military fatigues for suits, but the former rebel still has a keen interest in military matters, especially when it comes to the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. During our stay, Kinshasa and the UN accused Kigali of fermenting rebellions in Congo's east provoking a number of emergency presidential meetings. Instead of a leisurely stroll around his residence's garden, we ended up in a heated conversation over the matter. Asked about the potential implications of Congo's falling apart, the usually placid Kagame for once let out a burst of irritation. I don't know and I don't care. Don't make it my problem, please. Yes, no, no, make it the Congolese problem and make it this international community's problem. Yes, no, because I, I shouldn't be asked matters to do <laughs> with the Congo know. all the time. Ask me about Rwanda now, let's, let's go into Rwanda. But even in Rwanda, issues annoy its leader, mainly criticism leveled by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International for his crackdown on opposition and the media. Not to mention claims by former senior administration officials he's a war criminal. In Africa, there is nobody who is popular with his people, no. If you are, then you are just a dictator. Popular, popularism, being popular is only a, a, a preserve of developed countries. The others, when they are popular with the people, they are dictators. This is a standard people in the media set and that's how they want to look at That's it. That's bordering on racism. It is bordering on everything bad, yes. Armed forces and security are certainly an inescapable reality in today's Rwanda, especially around the president. His 90% plus scores in presidential elections are also troubling, but he's convinced that they reflect the fact a vast majority of Rwandans, whatever their ethnic backgrounds, support him willingly, rather than because they're forced to do so. Kagame cannot make all these things happen you see out there alone. 
no. Even in battle, you may be a good general, but if you don't have good fighters, I don't think you go anywhere. Fakagami, a good soldier doesn't look back on his past, however painful it may be. From history that has been so tragic, let's not be heartbroken <laughs> to the point that we can even lose the future. <laughs> let's pick our pieces, put them together and learn a lesson from this tragic situation and move on because it's too late. There is, there is nothing we can do. We can't reshape our past. With much of his life given to politics, any time the Rwandan president gets to make room for his family is vital. Kagame is eager to show us how a lunch with his wife and children as often as possible is part of his way to unwind. When asked if he really intends to leave politics after his second and in theory last mandate ends in 2017, he's adamant, even impatient. I have a country already, so which I never had in my life. So for me, the moment I have a country, and a country that is increasingly stable and moving on, I have everything. I don't have to worry at all. I even go to my home somewhere and sleep and read and write and, and enjoy. That's a rare privilege for the African leader. The evening of the independence ceremonies proved one such moment. He hosted a party for his friends in one of Kigali's main hotels. But the avid football fan had one desire before he arrived. The Arsenal supporter wanted to catch the first half of the European Championship finals. For once, Paul Kagami could set aside his official responsibilities. As I was there, some people were approaching me and were starting to tell me some official things. You know, President, I know I've been looking for you, there is this. I said, please, can you forgive me for this moment? Let's all relax and feel happy and let go. And I look for you and we deal with those matters another time. And not just tomorrow, but for another five years, when Paul Kagami is supposed to get far more than just a single night's break.